Welcome to Daily Armor. Our verse today will be found in the book of John, chapter number 10. The book of John, chapter number 10. And we'll be looking at verse number 38. So if you'll look in your Bibles to John, chapter 10, and verse 38, it says, But if I do, though ye believe me, not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. This verse here is... Um, the Lord Jesus has been confronted uh, by the Pharisees, and they're questioning him. They're, they're, he's always at odds with the Pharisees. They are just, they just can't fathom <clears throat> why anyone would do and say the things that Jesus would do and say. And he's saying, if you don't believe me that I do my Father's work, that I am from the Father, he's saying, if you don't believe that I am who I say I am, then believe me because of the works that I do. Because no man could do what Jesus was doing but God. Therefore, Jesus was saying, I am God, and you can believe me that I am God because the things that I do prove that I am God, and I am who I say I am. So it's believe the works that you may what? That you may believe and know that Jesus is the one and true and only God. And I got to ponder on that little phrase, this, that little phrase, believe the works that ye may know and believe. I just kept saying that over and over and over in my head, over and over and over in my mind, thinking about what are those things that we know that what God says in his word, but then yet we need to see something. And because, not because of him, not because of what he said, but because of our own internal disbelief, our own internal problems. Um, there's a verse that I found this morning. Let me grab it. It's right here. 1 Timothy 2, 8. I like this verse. Um, it says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting without wrath and doubting. Wrath is those things that you see externally that somebody does, that they're letting their tempers flare, that they're angry, and it's so obvious, and it's something that they do on the outside. It's a sin on the outside. And Timothy is saying, I wish men would just be praying, lifting up holy hands to the Lord, realizing that put yourself in that predicament where you are you are vulnerable and you are at the mercy of the hand of God. And that is when we're praying. And our whole lifestyle should be as as that pray without ceasing. That should be really our whole lifestyle. But so Timothy was seeing men that were full of wrath and anger and all this outra outrage that was on the outside. But he also was seeing people that were doubting. That doubting, that comes from internal. That is from within. Somebody might would say, well, I didn't say nothing. Well, it was all over your face. Well, I didn't do anything. Well, it was obvious, you know, that it was something going on the inside that Timothy could recognize seeing on the outside that, you know, it, it's either by something that you, you choose not to do or that you're leery of. Um, it's not in always what we say and do, but that doubting that wells up from within, we can say a whole lot on the uh, with our expressions um, about what's going on in our mind. And Timothy was noticing that in so many around him. And he was he was saying, oh, Lord, I, I, I wish so many times that men would just stop pitching a fit and that men and women and men and women alike that they would stop pitching a fit and that, that they would simply stop doubting as well and go to you in faith praying to you in faith let themselves be vulnerable let themselves um let themselves believe and wait and i think that's so many times when trouble comes up is because well we want to believe but then we're we're waiting and so then while we're waiting, those doubts can flare up. And I think of this morning, I was thinking about those things. And there's a lot of examples of it in the scripture. And we have to look within ourselves and ask, I'm asking myself, Lord, what is it that, what doubts am I struggling with? What things 
um, am I struggling with? And you're telling me over and over and over in your word on my prayer sheet, I have so many scriptures around my prayer sheet um, that talking about um, that this is impossible. With man, it is impossible, but with God, nothing is impossible. And I say that and I read that and I look at that scripture over and over and over again, but yet in those small little moments, what are those doubts and what are those fears that I have? What what happens? And what do I do about it? What do I do about it? And so I want us to look um, in the book of Judges, chapter number six, as I've been thinking about um, Gideon quite a bit here lately. Um, and I want to go there um, this morning. And let's go to Judges chapter, I want to start in Judges chapter six. Judges chapter six. Let me get turned there. Y'all are probably already there. I need to put my glasses on so I can see better. Judges chapter 6, and I want us to start at verse number 11, um, and this is the, the angel of the Lord comes with a message, and, and there's a calling on Gideon. There's a calling of, for him to do some things, and for him to do some really impossible things. So we have to remember when it, when the Lord's doing something in our life, he's, it's not because of that we have such wonderful abilities, it's because it, it, that if you're usable, if you just don't doubt, if your just confidence is not in yourself, and my confidence isn't in me, it's in him. And when my confidence is in him, there's so much he can do with me and so much he can do with you when we simply believe. The, the Lord Jesus in our, in our verse today, he was challenging those Pharisees. I know that it's so hard to comprehend. And if you are having a hard time with the things that I'm saying, believe the works believe the works, believe the things that you see, believe the miracles. That was the purpose of the miracles. Um, if you wanted to read about a lot of the miracles, the book of Mark is just full of the Lord's miracles, miracle after miracle. I mean, from the beginning, um, turning the water into wine where they're pouring water and nobody knows but those servants that they have poured water into these, uh, to these vessels and then they're serving them and they're serving them to the to the head of the um, of the of the wedding ceremony, and they're pouring this out, and they're seeing wine come out. They're seeing this juice flow from this 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 vat, this this pitcher, and yet they know they put water in it. So it's not about what we're able to do; it's about what the Lord does with what. We have, and what he does is he multiplies it. He does so much with it. It's so, it's, it goes beyond. And I was thinking about um, Gideon, which I had been reading, you know, a lot here lately of, of the in, in the book of Judges about Gideon. So I know this is why it's, it's still fresh on my mind. But I was thinking about um, the, the call on Gideon's life and how he had that, he had that disbelief. He had that, the, he had those doubts. But he didn't stay there, and that's the that stuff's gonna come up. We're gonna we're gonna have some things come up, but what do we do about it? Do we let it stop us? No, we do something about it. We just have to go to Him, and we're praying, and we're studying, and we are asking the Lord to help us. And how He chooses to help us is is is, is all up to Him. When I ask Him, Lord, I I have some problems in this area, and I don't know what to even ask for. I don't even know how that you're going to show me, um, you know, that, that I'm on your mind or that this is, that I'm going in the right direction here. But Lord, I just pray that you show me your way. And here we've got um, the call to uh, for Gideon here in verse number 11 of Judges chapter 6. And it says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak tree, which is an Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abazarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So here you're all inter you're you're introduced in this one verse, which the the if you read about the first um, ten verses is all about this oppression of the Midianites and what they were doing. They were starving them. They were um, they were right there when their crops would be coming. Um, you know, coming up, they would, they were going and destroying them, the, the, the crops, the, the animals, they were starving the people. Um, if we look back, I, I saw it this morning. Let me see if I can find it. 
Uh, verse number six, if you'll go back and look how burdened the people were, and they were there because they had left the Lord. They had um, took their eyes off the Lord, and so they were being punished, and they were being punished, the Lord said, for seven years um, by the Midianites. But it says in verse number six, and Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So they were very impoverished. They were having so much trouble. They were struggling so much. And here we find um, here we find Gideon, and he's threshing wheat in a wine press. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. But he was doing it because he was trying to do it and hide from the enemy. He was trying to uh, gather something so that he could he, that that people could be fed, and he was having to hide it down in a wine press, so back behind some some walls. And um, so it was. They were, uh, you know, in a terrible, terrible time in their life. And it says in verse number twelve, we'll go back to verse number twelve. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. So you've got Gideon hiding in a wine press, and he's being told you're a mighty man of valor. I'm sure that he was like, What? <laughs> you know, I mean, that would have been my first first doubt that would have come up. What? <laughs> Mighty man of valor, you know, mighty woman of valor, me, I'm just over here doing my little thing in private, you know, I'm trying not to stand out, I'm trying not to be noticed, you know, it's just one of those things that I've always battled with, um, you know, and it's, but yet the Lord was saying, it's time for you to do some things. And, and you, you know, and seeing us the way that he sees us, but not the way we see ourselves. And so that's, that's a lot of times where those doubts come up. Um, it's because we know our weaknesses and that's all we think about. And God sees past our weaknesses into what he can do with us. He knows what he can do with us in spite of our weaknesses. And sometimes because of our weaknesses, he, there's so much he can do with us. Those that think they have everything figured out, there's nothing that he can do with them. The Pharisees struggled because they would not believe. They would not, um, they would not see past what, you know, what made sense to them. And so many times we have to see past what makes sense and look to what God can do. And, and those are, those are things that are just impossible for any, for anybody else, um, but God. And so we're here, so we're seeing that he gets a word from the Lord. And I want us to notice, um, I want us to notice several times here in the book of Judges chapter six of, of him getting a word from the Lord. So he gets a word and it's kind of an unbelievable word. It's 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 a shocking word. And we see that in verse number 11 and verse number 12. Look again in verse number 14. Uh, before we look at any other thing, look in verse number 14. It says, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? So here's another word from the Lord. Now jump down to verse number 16. It says, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. He's saying, You're going to do some shocking, amazing things because I'm going to be with you, because I'm going with you, because I have sent you. If I've sent you to do something, then I'm going to give you those abilities to do that. And it's going to shock and amaze you. And it's not because you are you know, maybe that, you know, he could bench press so much. It's not because maybe he was tall. I mean, he might have been the smallest, um, you know, thinnest, you know, nothing about him would have stood out as a mighty man of valor. Yet God saw him as a mighty man of valor. Why? Because he knew what he could do with him if he could simply get him to believe in the Lord and the Lord's power, not in his own power and might, but in the Lord's power. And so let's move on. I want you to also notice down in verse number 23, and it says, And the Lord said unto him, this is talk, he's talking to uh, Gideon, and the Lord said unto him, be, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. So the Lord knows how to tell us what we need to hear because he knows those things that we're feeling and thinking on the inside. Even if we don't express them on the outside, he knows what's going on on the inside, and he knows just what to tell us. He knows just the word to say, just that. I mean, sometimes when you have a word from the Lord on it, all you, like so many times, all I have had was trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Sometimes that is all I've had to go on to keep moving forward. And sometimes that's all you've got to go on, um, but to keep moving forward. But it's that, that simple 
word from the Lord that can keep us pressing on. And we see here, um, I want us to look, go back up to verse number 13. And I want you to see some of the responses that Gideon has. In verse number 13, it says, um, And Gideon said unto him, talking to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles? Which our fathers told us of saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So here he's got some doubts. He's got some worries. He's expressing, um, you know, his anguish and, and his um, despair uh, and, of what they're going through. And he is talking to the Lord. In verse number 15, he's also, and the Lord in the between time is responding. But, the, but Gideon also says, and he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. This is where he's saying, I am the least qualified person that there is. Um, he's saying, I'm from the smallest of the tribes, and I am uh, in my, and within my father's house, I am the least. I am the least likely. When you look at King David, and you remember when uh, the Lord told Samuel to go anoint him a king, he had chosen somebody. He said, "I want you to go to the house of Jesse," and he says, "When you go there, I'll 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 let you know which one it is." And so they go line up all these sons, and they don't even bother with David. He's out there tending to the sheep, and the Lord's saying, "Nope, nope." Nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. And and Samuel's at the end of all of them. He's like, Lord, you said it was going to be one of these. And then Samuel looks at Jesse. He's like, do you have any more sons? And he's like, well, I got one out in the field. And Samuel says, we ain't doing another thing until y'all go fetch him, until y'all go get David. And then when they brought David in, and it's, and it's all these brothers that are lined up, David was the very, very last one that they would ever have thought that God would have chosen to be his king to be who he chose for the people of Israel. Yet that's exactly who God chose. And here we see it happening again where Gideon's saying, but my tribe, the tribe I'm a part of, the, we're the smallest. And then even within my family, I am the least in the family. And so here he's expressing his worries and his disbelief that, Lord, you're saying I'm a mighty man of valor and you're saying you're going to use me to defeat the Midianites, but yet I'm the least likely subject. And that's exactly so many times the kind that the Lord can use. He can use us that are the least, that are the forgotten, that are the forsaken, that nobody thinks the Lord's going to ever, you're not going to amount to much. The Lord is saying, oh, I, there's so much that you're able to do. I see a mighty woman of valor. I see somebody that is so strong and that is so mighty because of what? The Lord is saying, because of what I can do with that person. So it's untelling what the Lord can do with us when we cast away those doubts and those fears. And we look at what he says, what he says he's going to do about it. And what he says that he can do with us if we'll just give over to him. If we just will just give it all over to him, you know, just just submit. He wants us just to submit to him and what wonderful things that he can do. So we also see um, one more place I want us to notice that where Gideon was expressing um, some, you know, some shock is when he, when he realized that the angel of the Lord left um, in, in the verses, per se, in, in like verse 18 through 21, in verse 22, Gideon says, and when Gideon Perceive that he was an angel of the Lord. This is who he was just talking with. Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. He's he's saying, I'm I'm gonna be dead. He's saying this is he's just he's just marveling at the presence, um, at, at what he has just witnessed, of what he has just experienced. He is just marveling in that, and he's feeling so unworthy. So how many times do you feel unworthy? I feel unworthy so many times. But yet the Lord has got a word for him in this instance too. This is where again what when I've when I've shared with you before. And it says, And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, verse 23, fear not, thou shalt not die. He knew how Gideon was receiving this. And he's like, I don't want you to worry. I want you to have peace about it. You're, you know, I want you to be confident, not in you, but in me. And so many times that's what we need. And when when all these things happen. Now, there's going to be some adversaries. There's going to be some things that are going to well up. When the Lord is, is giving you something to do, and he's saying you have it within yourself to do this, not because of you, but because of me, because of the Lord, because of, of what I can do with you, 
then there's going to be some opposition. And the Lord gives him some commandments before he sends him out there against the Midianites. I want you to notice that in, in Gideon's response, um, if you go back to Gideon's response, and I want us to look at those because I really, really um, hadn't noticed it too much until this morning when I was reading over this scripture. Um, and, it's, and I want us to go back to uh, verse number 17. And this is Gideon talking to the Lord, talking to the angel of the Lord. He's talking to the angel of the Lord. And he said, and he said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then, have, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Uh, verse number 18 says, Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. So the angel of the Lord says, I'm going to wait on you. So what Gideon does is he goes and he prepares to worship. He is worshiping the Lord. He wants to, he wants to give something of himself. He wants to offer up something to himself. He is seeking worship. And that so many times is the transformation that takes place from the doubting to the worship, from those worries into worship. When we can turn our worries into worship, I don't want us to miss that. Turn your worry into worship. It's because it's all about him. It's not about us. It's all about him. And that's what Gideon's doing here. And he goes and he prepares. It says in verse number 19, And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of ephah of flour, the flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out unto him under the oak, and presented it. He is presenting it. He is worshiping the Lord. He has presented his offering to the Lord, and the Lord is accepting his offering. It says this in verse number um, 20, And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes and there rose up from the rose up fire out of the rocks and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. All this happened and, and Gideon realizes that he has been in the presence of this angel of the Lord, that he has been in the presence of the Lord. He has just he has offered up what he could. It was he worshiped with the Lord, and the Lord accepted his offering, and that's what worry should lead us to worship, it should lead us to pray, and, and then, and say, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, and I'm going to go against what my flesh is telling me, and I'm going to move forward, and I'm going to worship you, and I'm going to thank you, and I'm going to praise you in advance, before he had to see anything, he was going to worship the Lord, and then we see here, that there's some challenges that happen um, because he's got a whole mindset. Now the Lord is he's saying, you're ready. And he starts with the, there's a war that he's going to have to battle with. And before it even gets to the Midianites, it's going to be a war from within his own family. Uh, because like I said, they were there because they had left the Lord. So here they are, and you'll read it in these verses, and they're not even worshiping the Lord. They are actually having the little altars and little idols set up, and they're worshiping Baal. And so the Lord is saying, go from within, be an example from within. So it's, this is, he's having this private worship with the Lord. We see this in these verses where he prepared, made ready that kid in verse number 19. And he offered up his um, offering to the Lord. But then the Lord is saying, now you have to do something public. Now you're making a public pro proclamation and you're doing it right in front of your family and your friends. And it says in verse number 25, and it says, and it came to pass, the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that it is that is by it. He's saying, I want you to tear down your father's altar to Baal. I want you to make a public proclamation. This is wrong. This is wrong. We are the Israelites. We are, our father is in heaven. We don't worship Baal. I want you to throw down that altar and make a public form of worship um, to the Lord. And it says, uh, verse 26, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God unto the upon the top of this rock and in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the grove, which the which thou shalt cut down. So here you see, we see that private uh, worship. Now this is a public worship. He's wanting to do the same thing in front of everyone. He's wanting him to uh, make a public form of worship in front of everyone, not be 
ashamed and not be fearful. Um, this was going to cause quite a stir. This was going to be getting people to wake up and open up your eyes. And this is not right. These are some things that are not right. This is not the way the Lord wants us to uh, worship. This is not who we're supposed to be praying to. We don't pray to Baal. We don't worship Baal. We shouldn't be bringing no offerings to Baal. We worship the one true living God. And we should take our worship only to him. Only to him. And this is going to cause... Um, when we make a public proclamation, this is going to cause some war, not just with the enemy. I mean, it's obvious that this is going to cause some problems with the Midianites. This is going to cause a stir. It was going to be getting their attention, but not just the attention of the true enemy. There's going to be some enemies around us that really shouldn't be our enemies. This is some enemies within. We've already had to battle with our doubts and our fears from within. Now we're going to have to deal with the doubts and the fears that are going to be amongst um, our family and our friends, those that should be supporting us that we're we're causing some, we're bringing some lights to some things to them that they're <coughs> excuse me they're not wanting to look at they're not wanting to focus and they're not wanting to admit his father was not going to want to admit here i have this altar to bail i should be ashamed of myself gideon is going to be the one that's going to point that out we're going to tear this down and we're going to put up a true altar and we're going to worship our god not be afraid and not be uh, ashamed <coughs> I want to proceed on. The thought I had in my mind this morning was going back to that John chapter 10, verse number 38, which says, believe the works. Believe the things that you see. If you don't believe what I say, he's telling the Pharisees, if you don't believe what I say, believe what I am doing because I cannot do this outside of being God. Outside of God doing this through me, it can't be done. So believe the works. And so this is, um, this is what happens. It's time um, Gideon's going to go into battle. He's kind of, he's, he's, he's worshiped. Um, now he just needs a little confidence booster here. He's, he's wanting a little bit of confidence booster here. In verse number 36, it says, and Gideon said unto God, if thou wilt save Israel by my hand, he's still having those doubts. That's his own doubts. He's doubting himself. He's not doubting God. He's doubting himself. And, uh, if thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside them, shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, and thou shalt, as, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early in the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. The ground was dry, and the fleece was wet. He's saying, I'm going to know, because this is impossible. This is absolutely impossible for the ground to be dry and the fleece to be what would be impossible. And then he asked him again the second night, just to be honest, just to be sure, just to cast out the rest of those, you know, just to have something to say, see, devil, I'm telling you, I, the Lord's saying that, that he's chosen me. I don't know why, but that's up to the Lord. Um, but, and this is what God has chosen. So here we're looking again and he's asking again. Let not that hand, thy anger be hot against me, verse number 39, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece and upon all the ground. Let there be dew. So the dew's going to fall, the, all the grass, everything around is going to be wet, but he wants this, he's going to leave this fleece out, and he wants that the, the, there be completely dry, the fleece be completely dry. And that's exactly what the Lord does. It's just a simple little thing. Sometimes it's the simplest little thing that... You are just shocked and amazed that this this came to pass. That something was said, something was done, something was preached, um, something um, you know. Maybe there was a test. Maybe there was um, just. I, I, there's so many different scenarios. Maybe it was just something little, something so personal that you not you, you didn't even tell anybody about. Nobody knows this. Your spouse, your best friend, they don't know this, and you have prayed this to the Lord. And yet there was something specific to you, personal, one-on-one -on -one between you and him, that he has shown you, that he has revealed to you, that he has done this wonderful work in front of you, just to give you that little bit of confidence, just to let you know, you can believe what I said. Why? Because you can believe what I've just done. Because I've done this for you. This is something so, so specific and personal to you. Now you're ready. You're re you can you can push aside all those doubts and all those fears, and you're ready. So I don't know what 
I'm ready for. I don't know what you're ready for, but the Lord has wonderful things to do with us if we will simply not doubt and only believe him, only believe the word of the Lord. And if you are struggling with what he's saying, then look for those wonderful works that he's going to do in front of you, that he's going to be giving you that little bit of confidence with and take those and believe those. So put all that together and push, let that push away. Let that be um, that shield that you put up for those fiery darts that are coming at you, those fiery darts of doubt and fear. That's going to be your shield. That's going to be your confidence because it comes from the Lord. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to seeing you again soon.